Alrighty. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Emerging Leaders Network Digital Dish with Hamilton Community Leaders. My name is Alyssa Lai, and I'm a communications professional working at a financial services cooperative called The Cooperators. Fellow Hamilton residents Sarah Wardrobe and I have the pleasure of moderating tonight's discussion. We're looking forward to hearing from our panelists and getting into the questions from you as participants later tonight. Before we begin, it's important to set the stage with proper land acknowledgement. We're gathered here today in the city of Hamilton, which is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is the agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Additionally, this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. While well, we're used to hearing land acknowledgements, spending time to set this context is important today more so than ever, especially in light of many recent issues. The violence directed at the Mi'kmaq fishers, the backlash faced by Indigenous land defenders as Six Nations on the development site, and the unacceptable treatment of Indigenous peoples as they seek to receive the clinical care they deserve. These are not one-time incidences, so I urge you to take personal action to learn about the issues and support Indigenous communities in your own way. I will now pass over the virtual mic to Rebecca Carlson from this Emerging Leaders Network to share a little bit about ELN. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, welcome. It's great to have you here with us today. Um, so as Alyssa mentioned, my name is Rebecca Clausen, and I'm the program manager of the Emerging Leaders Network. Um, so I was going through the registration list earlier today, and I saw a number of familiar names. So it's great to have some of our longstanding Hamiltonian ELNers here with us today. Um, but I also noticed a number of new rising leaders who um, are, are new to the Emerging Leaders Network. So I'd like to personally welcome you to the ELN um, and just want to take a couple minutes to share a little bit um, about our network and, and our programming. So the ELN is a program under Civic Actions Leadership Foundation that connects, develops, and activates rising leaders from across the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. So we've been around since 2006 and we're now 2,600 rising leaders strong, representing a wide range of backgrounds, communities, and sectors. Um, we're lucky to have folks from the nonprofit, public, private, academia, um, and folks who are still just figuring out uh, what they wanna do, but know they're dedicated to bettering our region. So the ELN is free for anyone to join who identifies as a rising leader in our region and members get access to monthly programming on topics related to city building, civic issues, and leadership development. Since the arrival of COVID-19 in our region, we have pivoted all of our programming online. So you may have seen our hashtag, uh, hashtag ELN online, um, which includes webinars, discussion groups, digital mentorship, a virtual book club, um, and, and lots of different events. Um, so if you are a member of the ELN, you'll receive our monthly newsletter, which is where you can be the first in the know about different uh, events, opportunities, and programming to engage with us. So of course, as part of our online programming, we have the Digital Dish series, um, one of which we're, we're all here for tonight. So a little bit about where this came from within the ELN. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, we connected with our membership. Um, we reached out to rising leaders through discussion groups, through a survey, um, to see how you were doing and what you needed from us, how we could support you. So we heard that one thing rising leaders really wanted was to be connected to decision makers, connected to each other, and connected to community leaders, to be able to contribute your voices, um, ask your questions, and conversations around COVID-19 relief, recovery, and rebuilding. So we're really excited to have some folks here tonight um, to do so. And before we jump into that, um, 
We're really lucky to have our Civic Action CEO, Leslie Wu, here with us tonight. So I'm going to turn the virtual mic over to Leslie to share a little bit about Civic Action. Thanks so much, uh, Alyssa. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And welcome to all the panelists and to all uh, the ELNers. Uh, my name is Leslie Wu. I am the new CEO of Civic Action. This is day 50 for me, and it is a pleasure for me to be here for two reasons, actually. Um, back in 2005, I was one of the few beginning groups that uh, got together before we even were named ELN to, um, to just really gather and find support with each other, connect with people from different industries, different sectors. Uh, we didn't have a specific uh, agenda or issue, but we knew that uh, we were part of organizations who were making big decisions and we wanted to see how we could be uh, a significant influence in that. And that, so it's amazing to be here today, so many years later, it's probably about 15 years later, which tells you a little bit about my age. Um, and um, to see that, first of all, we're in Hamilton. And second of all, the growth of the network and the that the passion and enthusiasm continues on to this time. The second reason I'm excited to be here is because Hamilton is near and dear to my heart. My two first uh, co-op work terms were in Hamilton, so I can uh, tell you what it was like then, nothing like it is now. And um, as well, my daughter and her partner just chose Hamilton as their hometown. So I am delighted that to be part of your discussion today. I think Rebecca talked about uh, Digital Dish and why it was um, uh, came to be, but I think one of the key reasons why I've decided to take on the leadership of Civic Action and why the conversations you have today are so important is we're at the, at the, you know, right in the middle of what I refer to as three seismic shifts in our being. One is the fact that uh, we are now all, all the country, the province, the cities having to deal with how we recover economically. Um, uh, the second big shift is around the types of gaps in our social infrastructure and that the lockdown and COVID has exposed so a uh, bear to all of us. It's very raw. And then thirdly, this awakening finally about the fact that in Canada, in Ontario, in the greater golden horseshoe, racism is alive and well and needs to be addressed. And so I think as you think about and as the panelists talk about all that is in front of you, you are the future of our region, you, you represent uh, so many facets of what is going to be part of our success. So I'm delighted and honored to be sharing the time with you. I would particularly like to thank uh, Miriam and Nicole from the ELN Executive Committee who have been dedicated to getting this event here today. Um, I want to thank Alyssa and Sarah. Um, they're called former ELN exec members, but I feel ELN is like Hotel California. You don't ever really leave. So thanks for being here with us. And uh, a special thanks to our speakers, um, Rachel, Tammy, and Josefa for taking the time out of your busy schedules. This is, you know, the dinner hour, family time hour, and you're all uh, spending time uh, away from that. So we are greatly appreciative of that. I hope that um, going forward, uh, as I uh, begin to move forward with civic action and as our board begins to think about how we can have an even greater impact, that you will be a great source to us, that you'll pick up our, the phone when we call to ask for your advice. As much as you may be seeking our advice, we're seeking yours as well. And without that, I just want to let you know, I do have to leave at seven for another event, but uh, I wish you all the best for the evening. I'll stick around for a bit and I'll get the evening back on track and hand it back over to Sarah and Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, so now I think we're just going to do a quick housekeeping before we dive in. So, um, welcome to Zoom webinar. You probably may be familiar with some of how it works by now after six or seven months of um, Zoom everything, but I'll just cover um, really quickly. Tonight we'll go through, um, yeah, our moderated discussion and then we will have time for a Q&A um, from the audience. So, 
In order to do that, there's a Q&A function on um, Zoom, so you can throw questions in there at any point throughout the night. And there is also the option to, um, I think, vote and upvote different questions that you really want to hear answered. So um, definitely use the Q&A questions anytime. And then even if you don't have a question, check it out, upvote what you want to hear um, answered. Um, and then Alyssa and I will kind of go through those questions during the Q&A period. Um, and yeah, there is also the chat function, but um, yeah, you can kind of share comments, ideas, et cetera, throughout the night, or if you're having some technical issues or we're having technical issues, but we don't realize it, you can throw all those different uh, comments in there. Um, yeah, so, um, before I introduce our panelists, um, just to give some quick context, um, uh, you know, Rebecca set the stage for the Digital Dish series, but when we were kind of trying to focus it on what would a Hamilton specific digital dish look like, we were kind of reflecting on how, um, you know, for a number of years now, but even throughout the pandemic, um, Hamilton has had this great um, focus on some different investment um, and bold new projects and opportunities, um, which is really exciting. Um, but at the same time, um, going through the pandemic has also highlighted some key existing issues for the city, such as um, you know, transit, affordable housing, and unemployment. So in, when asking the question, you know, what does recovery look like for Hamilton, we kind of thought, um, it's a bit of a question of, you know, do we really focus in on those bold investments um, and double down on that? Or do we need to maybe take a step back and put um, some more energy into these key issues? And um, for those of you who maybe say we could do both, um, maybe, maybe we'll hear that tonight. But I would also say, you know, we only have so much, you can only focus on so many things at a time. So really what direction um, would the city look to take? Um, on these two paths. Um, so that's kind of the context of the discussion um, tonight. Um, and so I'll just introduce, we have three um, awesome panelists here today to take us through that discussion. And so I'll just introduce them quickly now. Um, so first we have Tammy Wang. Uh, Tammy, yep, so as, they, as I introduce them, they'll pop up on the screen, which is exciting. Um, so Ham Tammy is a passionate Hamiltonian and city builder. Um, she works, um, in economic development for the city of Hamilton um, by day, and then um, in all the other hours, uh, weekends, evenings, holidays, et cetera. Um, she's the CEO of Commotion Group, um, who some of you probably have heard of, which is um, a small co-working space called Commotion on King. So that's Tammy. Next we have Huzaifa Saeed. So Huzaifa, um, will pop up in a moment, I think. Um, recently, uh, you know, switched careers to become the manager of partnerships for Thrive Career Wellness Platform, which is an HR uh, tech firm that focuses on supporting individuals through career transitions. Um, before that, um, he worked in public, uh, public policy and government relations. Um, so some of you may know him from working at the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And then he also was at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, he's a proud once and future Hamiltonian resident and attended uh, McMaster. And finally, we have Rachel Braithwaite. So um, Rachel has lived in Hamilton for um, 11 years and has worked with uh, community organizations and neighborhood associations. Uh, she founded the uh, Barton Village Festival, um, which hopefully some of you have attended or are familiar with. Um, and is currently the executive director of the Barton Village Business Improvement Association. And so for those who don't know, um, we have a number of those BIAs across the city and they really focus on, you know, supporting their local businesses, hosting community events and um, advocating for investment in, um, in their areas. Um, and then outside her old BIA, um, she enjoys spending time with her family in on Hamilton's many uh, nature trails. So those are our three panelists for tonight. Um, I hope you're excited to dive in. I know I am. So I'm going to just throw over to Alyssa now, who's going to open us up with the first. Um... Thanks very much, Sarah. So to prime the pump and get the conversation going, um, I'm going to start off the conversation with um, an opening question. 
Um, what is one issue that has become even more prevalent within the city since the pandemic started? Um, I'm going to start off with Tammy for you to add your thoughts. Go ahead, Tammy. Man, there's a lot of different issues that's happening with the pandemic. And I think that we've all been, um, and I think Rachel said it best the last time we met, we're all kind of pandemic out and we just kind of want this done. But I've got to say that in my world, so today, even though I wear the hat of both government employee and small business owner, I will mostly put on the government employee hat which may or may not infuriate many of you. It, I know that I may or may not infuriate Rachel and Huzefa. <laughs> but, but today, when I think about it from the city's perspective, I think the, there are many different hats that we as a city have to look at, everything from social to environment and sustainability. But the one I really want to focus on is small business. And the fact is, uh, a vast majority of our economy in Hamilton is on the back of small business. So I think that the pandemic has really exacerbated how fragile small businesses can be and what are some of the different opportunities or ways that we can go off and actually try and help our small businesses. And again, taking off my putting on small, small business has suffered. So we're, we're very uh, cognizant that small businesses is a massive, massive challenge and an issue right now. And I think that this is where you're going to start to see small businesses failing, which then means we lose jobs, which then means we lose wages, which then means it generates a significant sig uh, effect after the fact. So that's my uh, today I'm being small business. Thanks for the insights, Tammy. Um, who's I found? Onward to you. What are your thoughts on the question? Yeah, so I think um, I've been reflecting back a lot on, you know, uh, the Hamilton economy and, and the ambition, the idea of the ambitious city. And one thing that COVID-19 has really exposed, that something that has been building for a lot of years has been the inequity um, in the economic growth that the city has faced over the last uh, you know, five or ten years, city builders know about Hamilton as a model, um, and and the idea behind it always was that it's it's going to be like one of those uh, waterfall approaches where it will bring bring prosperity for everyone. But when you look at the job losses created by COVID nineteen, uh, and you look at the impact of COVID nineteen across different neighborhoods in the city, uh, by far disproportionately it has gone to people uh, from underrepresented backgrounds, people who are already on the precipice of the poverty line, uh, because they were the first people uh, typically working in uh, tourism, food services, accommodation, uh, manufacturing, uh, food processing, a lot of these different uh, industries that were hit very hard by COVID because they required social distancing. Uh, so I think when you look at the job losses, they're kind of disparately spread across the city. Um, and it's really laying bare, uh, and especially if CERB wasn't around, it would have made that situation even worse uh, in, in, in showing what, what Hamilton for whom Hamilton has become a great city to live in and for whom Hamilton had the promise and still has the promise of be being a great city to live and build a family and bring a, build a future in. And, and it isn't really panning out because of the external unexpected shock that uh, COVID-19 has brought. So, so it's really a lot of questions are being asked and, and, and you know, hopefully through this conversation, we can go over what those impacts are and what we can do about it. Thanks for your comment, Nuzaifa. Um, Rachel, onward to you. What do you think is the one issue that's become even more prevalent um, within the city since the pandemic has started? Great question. And I would totally agree with Nuzaifa and Tammy. I'm going to take the easy option and go really broad and say inequality, um, because I think it covers kind of both of theirs. So I'm kind of not arguing too much already. <laughs> um, but I really believe, I mean, we see it every single day, the in inequality is so much more heightened through COVID in inadequate access to housing, um, you know, for, for those that don't have it compared to those who do. It means you can't self-isolate. You don't have a secure place to go. You don't have access to the washrooms. You don't have, like, so many things, right, which has been completely heightened through, through COVID. And, you know, same again with safety and security. Um, talking about small businesses specifically, they typically are not property owners. So there's no security, there's no safety for them because landlords, unfortunately, I mean, we have some good ones, thank goodness, but we do have some 
not so great ones that are, you know, have kicked out commercial tenants that have doubled their rent, that haven't offered any rental assistance because it's not required. So um, it's really also showing the inequality in the goodness of people. We've got some great ones that have, have really supported our business. We are very businesses on Barton. We've been really lucky with them. But there's also been some that haven't. So it, it's really heightening the, the inequality in people's fairness. Um, it's heightening the, the inequality between independent businesses who are not cookie, cookie cutter. They are all independent, very different and do not fit the government models or the government regulations and requirements for any of the grants that they're giving or the, the financial incentives. Comparing them to the larger stores, like you know our favorites, Walmart and Amazon, I'm being facetious there, sorry everyone, if you like those stores. But you know the money you spend there does not go back to the local economy, yet it does when you go to the independent businesses. So they're not helping this economy, but they're the ones that are surviving the most through COVID because they have access to the legal requirements and lawyers to know what they can do. They have access to, you know, it's a one-stop shop for everything and, and so forth. So they can push and advertise themselves more. Whereas our local independent businesses, that to be honest with you, are probably safer to shop at than Walmart because you're not going to have the crowds, are suffering and struggling. So it's really tough. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all of these nuances. Um, this is a great conversation starter, and I think we'll be able to dive deeper into some of those topics. I'm going to pass it over to Sarah to ask our next question. Next question, mm -hmm. I say. Yeah, so one of the topics we want to dive into a bit further was small business. And so, um, in great opening, we, we touched on that a little bit already. Um, and so, we have seen obviously that, you know, a side effect of the pandemic has meant that you know many small businesses have had to change, um, scale down, or close. Um, but also, we have actually seen some small businesses or new small businesses open and an increase in some um, business development, um, which is exciting. Um, so maybe I'll start with Rachel. Um, can you maybe paint a picture for us, like the businesses that you work with? Um, what's the reality for them right now, and maybe? Think of that inequality piece, like what has um, uh, uh, been more challenging for businesses that are struggling and what maybe what has been successful for those that are thriving? Good question. Um, again, it comes back to that um, security piece. So we've had probably about four businesses that have closed since COVID started. And I would argue it's not because of COVID that they've closed. It's because of, unfortunately, a landlord that's not supporting them. Um, through other things. It could be, you know, their, their air conditioning's broken and it's the height of summer and they can't survive in that storefront because it's 30 degrees. So they've had to close. So it's not directly been because of COVID. It's been because of, unfortunately, landlords that are not as supportive as they could be. Um, so it, I think that's one thing that's really weighing on on our small businesses' minds and stressful for them too because they never know, Do am I gonna be able to go in my business tomorrow? You know, is my rent gonna go up next week because they're now offering me rent relief now? Are they gonna then up it in the future to accommodate for the, the, um, the, the smaller amount that I'm paying now? So there, I really feel that our businesses are under tremendous stress, um, you know, and, and they're typically mom and pop shops, right? It's one, owner um, that's doing everything, that's doing accounting, that's doing the, the purchasing for the business, that's doing the baking or the cooking, that's doing the cleaning, never mind going over all the requirements that are now uh, required, right? They're not experts in public health. They're not experts in you know policies and grants and finding access to information. So I really feel that they've got a few um, challenges for sure but to your point we have had some that have really been quite successful and have done amazingly well at adapting their businesses creatively through things like curbside pickup um, through sending home an experience with their meal kits and not just you know like a McDonald's here's here's fast food kind of thing you get to have for example one restaurant motel sent home little flamingos that light up and cocktails that are fancy so that you have that experience at home because that's what makes our independent businesses, right? It's about the experience. 
And then on Barton Street, we've had almost 10 new businesses open since COVID hit, which is amazing. So our, our entrepreneurs are so resilient and I'm so amazed by them, honestly. We have the best businesses in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. That's awesome to hear. And I've even heard of some on James Street North. And, and yeah, it's exciting that, you know, um, things are still happening for the city. Um, so maybe I'll open it up um, to either Zephyr or Tammy. Tammy, I know you had your small business hat on earlier. And um, resilience was something I think that you were interested in talking about as well. Like, how can we support our businesses in being um, resilient? So I'm not sure if maybe you want to touch on that a little bit with your hat, your small business hat. Oh, Sarah, you're causing me to cross the enemy lines here or something, right? <laughs> Um, I know that Huseifa has a lot to say about that too, so I'll just keep my comments really brief. Um, when I'm putting on my small business hat, it's a challenge. And as a small business owner, um, the regulations and the, and the grants change every single week, month, daily, hourly, like it's, it's really hard to keep up. And, and it's also um, a lot of the times things get announced, but the actual um, regulation, like the actual like finer points don't get released until like several weeks later so you're kind of left in this weird limbo for three or four weeks um but i will say that there's nothing like a pandemic to bring a community together so mm -hmm. with uh with this pandemic it's been quite amazing to be able to watch the community of hamilton come together and all of a sudden you see all these random facebook groups that show up Hamilton strong and the fempreneurs got bigger and there's all these amazing opportunities that way. Um, but in terms of putting back on my government hat, resiliency is something that we're also still looking at. We're still trying to understand how do we make our economy much more resilient so that the next pandemic, which we all know is likely going to happen again, um, but makes us stronger. So this is where we've started to put into place uh, different action plans and different economic recoveries in order to identify what are the uh, major levers that we can now affect in order, to, in order to help sustain current growth, but then also avoid a, another disaster or another sort of economic downturn. And this is where I'll um, encourage all of our people to go check out the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, they have just recently rolled out their economic blueprint for economic recovery. So they've given many recommendations of which some are pretty common sense type recommendations and then some that make that that are a little bit more difficult to implement right away, but it's it's something that is not being pushed under a rug. It's something that our team is really looking at um, how do we go forward and implement these things? So I'll pass it off to Huseifa to finish off some thoughts. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it has been covered, but um, Rachel, you were right initially that the uh, the landlords were a, a part of it. And I think part, and, and maybe it's bad luck, maybe it's bad policy. I, I lean towards the latter from the federal government, but um, they were supposed to get help um, small businesses in terms of rent relief, but until October 9th when they released a new program where uh, businesses can apply directly with the government, the idea was that the landlords would apply for relief and then they would get the relief and pass it on to uh, businesses. But clearly, you know, objectively, it's been proven that there wasn't much uptake and landlords were more willing, uh, you know, in Toronto and in, in the entire GTHA and Canada to uh, rather evict businesses uh, over, you know, give them a relief and, and then take the risk of finding a new tenant that's going to magically appear from somewhere. Um, and then, you know, every other day you were seeing those headlines where all these businesses that have been around for 20, 30, up to 40 years were uh, going out of business. Um, I, I think the other half of it though, and, and I haven't seen any government really take a lead on this, um, and there's some not-for-profits doing great work like Digital Main Street is, what this pandemic has exposed is that uh, digitization and having digital skills um, in your management team, but also your frontline staff um, is a very critical aspect. Um, you know, if you're if you are going to create a digital offering, if you're going to try digital marketing, ad spend, all these different aspects to get to the noise online. If you're uh, taking your you know frontline retail clothing business and, and trying to move it, um, for years the idea was that it will eventually like a slope, like everyone will have to catch up. 
uh, but the reality, reality with COVID, they're like it's it's a sudden you know a drop to the to the floor, and then all these businesses are now suddenly uh, having to scramble. And I think like organizations like Digital Main Street and and like the the Chambers of Commerce, they have some grant programs, uh, but I don't think it's enough. I don't think the it's well known, um, and I think the BIAs have helped, but like a lot of businesses in Hamilton aren't in a catchment area for a BIA, or maybe they're on a mailing list, and that was like had been an issue in Hamilton for a very long time. Is um, there needs to be like more communication, there needs to be more awareness. And just like, even from the political side, just more leadership on recognizing that this is a critical thing for you and you need to work on it. And, and you know, I, I just really haven't seen that movement. So I think that's, that's an area of opportunity where Hamilton can really take the lead because, you know, while we've been talking a lot of negative things so far, one of the interesting positive things about Hamilton is that a lot of people know each other it's very easy to understand where everything is and, and, and get a campaign out, get, get communications out if everyone's really committed uh, around the same table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true about the city of Hamilton, I find. Um, yeah, so maybe, so um, maybe we'll go back to Rachel. So Tammy and Husek have talked a little bit about kind of some of the supports that might have been available or that could be available. Again, maybe going back to just your experience um, working very closely with small business, like um, what, like where are the gaps from your perspective and what do we need to do as a city to, like as Tammy said, be resilient, support our small business, not only now, but to, to be sustainable for future. Good question. And I think that's a really important piece is we, do, we, are a bit reactionary right now in that there's this pandemic, what are we gonna do? Quick like scramble and throw eggs together in a basket and see if we can make an omelet and you leave all the shells with it and it doesn't really work that well and it's also not that sustainable. So I think it's really important for us to, to look at COVID, look at where our businesses are struggling. So for example, you know, things like the insecurity with your landlord and your rent well, maybe the city could look at coming out with, we have all these great commercial property improvement grants and incentives through the city, um, you know, to improve the property, but maybe we come up with one that supports small business independent owners to purchase property, to com purchase commercial property where they can live above and work below and, and have that security. Um, because right now, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, but commercial property is almost impossible to buy, even prior to COVID, like good luck. So um, it's never, that's unfortunately why we've got away from that mom and pop model where they would used to live above, work below. And unfortunately, because we've lost that model, we've lost that security for our small businesses, which is why we see so much turnover. Um, I mean, it, it's great they can set up a business with, with less strings attached, so to speak, but we don't have, have that continuity. We have much higher turnover and it's really tough for them to take that risk sometimes too, right? When you don't know what landlord you're, you're getting in with. Um, so I would definitely recommend those things. I would also recommend, you know, more um, education pieces for new businesses. You know, having workshops on looking at lease agreements, what should you look for in lease agreements? Having workshops on how to navigate all the current funding that's coming out. Another big issue, not really municipal, this one, this is more, you know, federal and provincial, is that, you know, you'll hear on the news, hey, the commercial rent assistance program, now businesses can apply. Great, but that's not ready yet. So, you know, our small businesses are hearing, hey, how come I can apply for this? Where do I go to apply? Oh, wait, it's not set up yet. So they're, they announce all these great programs, but they're not, they're not in process. So that's really frustrating for my small businesses because they need the money now and the money is being promised now, but they have no access to it. So things like that are really frustrating for our small businesses, for sure. Yeah, Tammy, hand raised. <laughs> oh, Actually, one of the things that uh, Rachel brought up was uh, was very timely because we've actually rolled out a new opportunity. I've put it into the chat 
uh, on our engage.hamilton.ca website, we're actually doing a big review on all of our community incentives. And that literally rolled out yesterday. So it's very timely for that type of feedback to come out now. But, and I think that this is also part of the challenge with working with um, in a pandemic time too. It's, it's how do we have this clear, transparent feedback and communications two ways between the government who has access to a little bit of resources, but not, not a ton. I mean, we, we ourselves also are suffering from lack of funding and also the way that we make money is taxes and, and that's, that's another challenge in itself. But how do we also engage our community to have these very hard, tough conversations? And this is where we want to try and roll out this engage.hamilton.ca. Um, actually, when you're on the website, you're going to see like six, maybe seven surveys that are currently active. And that's because we are actively trying to figure out what makes sense for our community. So I really want to make sure that they are able to um, reach out and like chat with us, but also we're not like hidden mysterious figures either. So, so I do encourage any of our ELN leaders to also just send us an email and maybe we can book a virtual coffee and we can always chat about these things too. But yeah, Rachel, what you said was um, super, super timely just because we're, we literally rolled this out yesterday and I literally made the socials for this yesterday. So, so there it is. Let's get some more uh, survey respondents. Thanks, guys. Well timed. Share more panels. Is that what spurred on, right? So that you could come to the panel with the answer. Okay, so uh, this has been a great discussion. Um, just to keep us moving, I know we'll have time to kind of loop back in the question period, but I'm just going to um, pass over to Alyssa for our next mm -hmm. uh, topic and question. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I want to talk about unemployment um, because I'm sure many of you have um, either know of someone who is unemployed or have heard of um, someone who is unemployed, either through a sector. Um, and as we know, different pockets of our community bear the brunt of unemployment differently, um, and in particular with young people. So the question right now is, as young people contemplate whether to stay and work in Hamilton, how has the pandemic affect the ability of young people to enter the job market? I'm going to turn my eyes to who's I've had to get started because um, I know this is a big topic that I'm sure all other panelists want to dive into. Go ahead, who's get us started. Yeah, I can, I can give it a shot. So it, it's like a very broad question and, and there's like a lot of different responses and, and a lot of it really depends on what your educational background is and what your current skill level is and, and what kind of job you're going for. Uh, so obviously with the uncertainty with social distancing, like it is very looking like very unlikely that if you're interested in food services accommodation or if that's where you prefer working, tourism, not-for-profits, uh, a lot of these traditional industries, um, you know, Hamilton's not going to be a great place to work, but, but neither is anywhere else in Canada unless you go, you know, far up north where, you know, everyone is not in stage two or stage one or even stage three where, uh, you know, things are a closer to normal than they are going to be in this community for a while. Um, I, I think the bigger challenge though is for a lot of young people, it's those entry level jobs that are the foundation for them being able to apply for uh, a well paying career job or even enter a well paying career as an entry level worker. Um, and right now, like in July, August, like um, even as far as about October, uh, the unemployment rate is still very high. Um, in, in, in late July or the August, it hit like past 12%. And even in the 08 recession, it only went up as high as 9%. So even though Hamilton's economy was creating a lot of jobs over the last few years, like um, a lot of that progress has been temporarily or, or the fears of many you know, economists in many communities are, are permanently wiped. And a lot of these communities are gonna have to go backward several steps in order to go uh, further up. So, so that's, that's a big concern is which community will offer you those entry level opportunities um, and are employers in Hamilton willing to uh, invest in, you know, digital onboarding? Are they willing to accept someone who might not be able to go physically to a location uh, for a while? Are they willing to make that investment? So those are big questions that I don't know the answer to, uh, but that really 
define things. But also the other the other aspect that I think we're seeing is um, Hamilton is still, despite rent prices falling in, in a lot of different communities, like when you look at like, for example, uh, post-secondary graduates who have a lot of mobility to go wherever they want, um, they can stay or they can move to Hamilton and take advantage of higher paying jobs in communities like you know, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, uh, where a lot of employers, like Shopify is a great example, um, have put an indefinite date on when they expect to uh, ask people to come back to a physical office. Uh, so you're seeing like announcements like that across Canada from some of the most uh, popular, you know, employers for young people. And, and, and that really raises the question of like, is ha Hamilton better as a bedroom community or are Hamilton employers going to step up and, and really aggressively go after uh, these young people and, and, and offer them training incentives, offer them, you know, a bit of a red carpet to say, hey, you might have the opportunity to work anywhere in Canada right now if you have certain skill sets, if you're in certain, certain industries and your job can be done virtually, but we would love to retain you because when this all hopefully ends and we go back to some sense of normalcy, uh, you know, you're the kind of workers that we might not have had a chance of retaining in the city or at our workplace, but because we made these extra measures, um, we, we, we are able to retain you. So th there's a bit of that, um, but I think the, the, the challenge remains that because COVID has hit and, and has created bigger impacts in, in lower income communities where a lot of these people were, uh, young people were reliant on these um, entry level jobs that are socially distance away. Um, you know, I am very worried that, you know, we will, you know, the, the headlines that you see sometimes in the Atlantic of like the lost generation, um, that those might come to fruition. Uh, you know, same thing with like the education system where a lot of people have been saving up for years and, and this was their chance to go to McMaster, Mohawk, um, or Redeemer College and then, you know, get a leg up in the labor market and, and suddenly, you know, you're now getting virtual education, you might get a virtual diploma at the end of it, but for a lot of individuals, if you look at research, uh, a big benefit to these campuses was the social capital that you earned. So suddenly, like by working from home, by studying from home, you're missing out on a lot of those aspects. So I think the city also has to care about how are we going to network these young people together? How are we going to build bonds between people from different social backgrounds? Uh, because a truly, you know, uh, successful and ambitious city like really enables that to happen. And, and like campuses can be a place for that, but so can like civic uh, platforms. Uh, so can, you know, like uh, events and not-for-profit organizations, volunteer organizations where you can build uh, those networks between the next generation that can really help, you know, bring people up together. So there's, there's like a lot of, as you can see, like a lot of different tangents in my head, but um, it could be a great opportunity for Hamilton. But unless you see proactive action, I think young people either have no options because their skill set is for a physical job or if, they, if their skill set an aptitude is for a virtual job, like a knowledge economy job. They have too many options right now because some great companies across Canada, uh, including us, uh, we're offering you know uh, remote jobs right now. And 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 we we you know we ourselves like we hired someone from Vancouver that we've never met. We have someone in Halifax that we've never met, um, and and you know they've been working with us for four months now, and and it wasn't a problem because we needed talent and we got it wherever we wanted. Okay. Going to put a pause on you right there, Uzeva, because there are a couple of things that you mentioned that I want to come back on. Um, but first of all, Tammy has her hand up. Go ahead, Tammy. All the things that Uzeva said, I totally see, I totally understand, but I also think that there's a real opportunity for our young people because today, right. with remote work, with from a city's perspective, what we're trying to do is we're trying to attract employers that are looking for the best talent. And when we attract employers we attract them based on our talent because we say to them hamilton has a top 75 university we've got the best mohawk college like we've got one of the best colleges in the gtha and the talent here is above par like amazing so when we speak to employers about that we also speak to them about the infrastructure infrastructure and if anybody who knows me on this call everybody's gonna know that i'm always gonna hammer home that internet is key. <laughs> the things that we need to work on is making sure that we get the right infrastructure in place for our employers, thereby enabling remote working 
opportunities. And then the stuff that we also talk about is quality of life. Hamilton's pretty awesome. You get a chance to have a three bedroom, two bedroom, two bath house that would cost like two times more than what we have today. So quality of life is a really fantastic um, opportunity. But I also want to push forward that we have a lot of entrepreneur resources and we have a lot of small business resources available. So this is also an opportunity for our young people to consider starting their side hustle, looking for some work, getting a day job in order to start something. Um, and it could be remote, could be whatever, but we have so many opportunities for our young people to also get started. And the nice thing is that the provincial and the federal government put a ton of money into young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that are under the age of 39. So there is a whack of different programs that are available in order to help facilitate starting new businesses for yourself, enable essentially looking at entrepreneurship as an actual career path. So I'd really like to say that I don't want to say that it's doom and gloom because yeah, it sucks. It sucks out there, but it sucks for a lot of people. There's a lot of people that have lost their jobs anyway. So I think that this is not just a youth issue. I think this is an all over kind of issue, but youth are in a very advantageous part right now because the government has spent so much money on encouraging youth and young entrepreneurship. So I think that there's a real opportunity there. Thanks, Tammy. I want to pick up on a few things that's mentioned before I direct my question to um, Rachel, because there are three things here that I'm hearing. One is there is the issue of the number of entry level jobs. Next, the format of jobs have changed significantly in a sense that there's greater flexibility, there's remote work and there's in office. And we hear Huzaifa saying that he has some colleagues all the way from Vancouver in a job. Um, and third, there's the issue of skill sets. So keeping in mind all these three different um, categories here, Rachel, I wanna ask where does this sit in, in the context of small business? How is this relevant? How does it play out in your world as you're seeing all these three factors come together? Good question. Um, I really feel that being an entrepreneur, it allows you to figure out what your skill set is and create your business around that. So for example, if you are a people person and you like chatting with people and you know, you kind of like making coffee and stuff, then maybe you want to run a coffee shop because then you get to socialize every day. But maybe if you're not a people person and you prefer to, you know, kind of sit in a back room and look at books and do numbers, then maybe you want to open your own accounting firm. Like I think the, the time is now, I think Tammy is completely right with regards to to finding out what you enjoy doing and doing it and creating that business. And I find that our young people these days are so amazing at just going for it, taking that risk and just going for it. Um, so, you know, all, all the power to them. I think that is so amazing. But I do think what Husefa was saying with regards to networking is also really a challenge um, but I think that the, the youth have a one-up a little bit there on other uh, age groups in that they're already so good at socializing and networking through, you know, the internet and social media and so forth, that they have that ability to bring it online and create those networking platforms that they can use to start up those small businesses. Whereas like for us on Barton Street, we have a lot of cultural businesses that have no social media presence, not even a website, nothing. Um, and so for them, they've never had to have that because they are a cultural gathering place that is basically like coming into someone's family home and celebrating a meal with them. And they stay there for hours on end. They've never had to market. They've never had to post photos or have a website or have a menu online. That is totally foreign to them. And so unfortunately, they're struggling a lot right now because they don't want to do that. That's not their business model. My business model is to sit and socialize. So it's really tough for them to survive right now, unfortunately, but that's where some of the younger generation could come up beside them and say, how can I help you get through this? Can I help create a website for you? Can I run your social media for you? And I think there's a, the ability to create more partnerships and more, um, more networking opportunities like that for sure. 
Thanks, Rachel. Um, it strikes me that there is a question of opportunities available, but also the question of matching and coordination. Um, so skills trade, for example, has always been in high demand and even so right now before. And then there's a question of what are the skills that the businesses need in order to um, one up the business and to be successful as an organization versus what are the skills that the actual up and coming um, people actually need to have in order to do the job well. Um, these are all complicated questions and issues that require some coordination and also some matchmaking in my opinion in thinking through who has the right skill in order to do what. Um, so I think that dovetails really nicely with um, conversation on um, Hamilton's progress moving forward and also what's the appeal of it from a global standpoint, not just locally. I'm going to pass it to Sarah to ask the next question there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, as Alyssa said, our kind of third topic is about um, international appeal and, and development. And so, you know, I mentioned at the beginning over the years, we've seen um, Hamilton pursue uh, these bold initiatives in a number of different areas. So some you may be familiar with, you know, LRT, um, the recent proposal for um, renewing downtown core, um, opportunities around the airport and the economic growth around, around that area, partnerships out of McMaster Innovation Park. Um, you know, there's been some talk of hosting major sporting events. So all these really um, cool opportunities really for the city and for development. And um, so I wanna maybe pass to Tammy to start. Can you tell us more about, I mean, I've, tried, I've talked on a few um, kind of broad, but like what's, what are some of those exciting things that are coming up from um, from the city in terms of projects and, and really like why is it important that we continue to pursue these now? Thanks. And this is a, this is one of those topics that um, there's a lot baked in and packed into all of these sort of thoughts. And there's a, there's a lot of strategies that are, um, that are intertwined with why we would do something like that. But I think I want to boil it down to thinking about one of the core opportunities or the core reasons why economic development exists is to look at how do we generate business, how do we attract business, and how do we grow businesses here in Hamilton. And a big reason for that is that if we think about what Hamilton is like right now, Hamilton's like 90% residential tax base. So in a municipality, what you want is you want to have more of an industrial base so then that way your businesses are also paying, are also paying the taxes. And they're also the ones that are contributing to the levy and to, to how we how we start to fund different things. But when Hamilton is 90% residential, myself as a residential owner, I'm paying taxes. And I'm also, but if we're trying to go after um, building bigger opportunity. Like, let's say it's building more infrastructure. Like, let's say it's about more internet, or maybe it's a bridge, or maybe it's a, a roadway. Where is that money coming from? It is coming from a 90% tax base that is based on residential landowners. So this is where you get up in arms about like, my taxes are going up. Hamilton already pays a lot of big taxes, but this is how we as economic development, we need to find opportunities for international investments that come to Hamilton, mostly because they're going to generate jobs, generate wealth, generate taxes to help offset some of these burdens that happen to sit on the residential tax base. So this is where a lot of these big initiatives are coming forward. The airport growth district, having an international airport in Hamilton is an amazing asset. But what we haven't done is fully leveraged it. So this is where the airport employment growth district, which is 555 hectares around the, our international airport is being sold and developed to massive developers. Then this is where you might've heard that Amazon came in and Amazon has over a million square feet of warehouse space. That is exactly the type of investment that we really want because Amazon's gonna generate 1500 jobs. That means our Hamilton residents are going to have jobs in Hamilton. That's also going to generate taxes. 
it's also going to generate an economic boom because if you think about all of the supporting industries that might come around just the fact that Amazon has now landed in Hamilton. So when we embark on some of these big initiatives, there is a larger strategy in place because the entire intent is to look at how do we drive more investment, more economic growth in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Rachel, do you want to chime in? So I'm going to play a little bit of an argument side here. So yes, it's great. We're getting a new employer. Perfect. I, I'm going to hold my stance on what kind of employer that is. But um, one thing I do want to point out through some studies that we've been involved with and so forth is that there is a lot of weight to having small businesses and more multi-level buildings as opposed to the flat box developments like the Walmarts like the Amazon warehouses, because it's one level. There is nothing above that. There is no residential above it, which means that's one tax base. Whereas if you look at the independent businesses, there is typically at least one or two levels above that commercial tax base. And you know, just to throw numbers out there, there's 13 BIAs in Hamilton, and they total $722 million in commercial assessment. So. They, they bring money in, and I would argue that there is more value per square foot from a small independent business where there's residential above than there is to a Walmart or a, a big box store that's one level any day. Tammy, <laughs> you want to respond? Agreed. <laughs> So this is why we also talk about densification, we talk about placemaking, and we talk about how do we have more people using the assets that we already have in a much better way. Um, I am also going to put another link in our chat that, that directs everybody to the Economic Development Action Plan, because we are now moving forward on a new action plan. Um, and that's why I want to make sure that I put that into the chat right now. But I agree 100% with Rachel. It's just one of those things where we also have to be mindful that we got baby steps. We got to get there. <laughs> so. And I think like it would be remiss if I didn't say that, but one of the most unfortunate pieces of news for, from Hamilton, from the mixed use, you know, so small, medium businesses and residential, um, like the dream of the LRT on the B line was, was something that drove young people, like young professionals, uh, people in high schools, universities, uh, you know, almost for a decade. Like the, from, from when I started at McMaster in 08, um, you know, that's when initial plans were in place. Like there was no idea where the funding was going to come from. It got approved. And then somehow, you know, years down the road, it's a long story. I'm not going to repeat it because most people might know it already, but now it's back, uh, you know, like, it, and, and, and the, the saying in Hamilton is that Hamilton knows how to, you know, um, take jaws from the, uh, you know, t taste defeat from the victories. Of, uh, what's that analogy? It's like, grab defeat from the jaws of victory yeah that one and it, it keeps coming back uh because it was so close and then the funding got pulled because council kept belaboring it kept delaying it and then you know like the the, the whole story i'm not going to repeat it but it's still potentially on the table uh due to the federal government him implying that they might be interested if the province is interested and the city is interested but you know for for many of us that was a big one like you know it's going to take a while it's going to create some disruption for businesses and residents along the route. But the end goal was that if we are interested in, in attracting those small and medium businesses, if we are interested in relocating growing businesses along a route where workers can easily move, you know, that was going to be it. So, you know, just, just had to say it because it's, it's, it's still, I'm still bitter. I like guess it's, it's a lot of people worked really hard for it. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, so, Tammy touched on this a little bit, maybe kind of the benefits of some of these projects, but I guess I'm wondering, like, from your um, perspectives, like, do you see a bit of a kind of a tension there in terms of we're pursuing these um, large uh, things that require significant investment in terms of dollars? Um, meanwhile, on the other hand, um, you know, we have people living in encampments. Um, 
uh, throughout the city and um, still some small small businesses that are struggling and closing and um, so I'm wondering I'll just throw it to whoever wants to start like do you see a bit of attention there or does it kind of those fit together um, in how we would think about addressing them Rachel I see your hand up yes it's a really tough one it's kind of like that chicken and the egg piece right but I really feel that Hamilton has the ability to set itself apart by making bold moves with regards to saying we need affordable housing and we're going to do something important about that about saying we know that bike lanes are more important that transit is is important right now so we're going to make bold moves and bold investment to support those initiatives and when they do that and when they step up and say hey we believe in these things that is what the next generation believes in. So they're showing that they're the city of the future. I think unfortunately, sometimes what holds us back, and I don't think there's any counselors on the line, so hopefully I won't get my hand slapped too much for saying this, but I think too much it's, you know, too many counselors are not buying into it. I mean, I don't know if everybody's watched that TVO show um, that just got released. I'll find the link and put it in the chat, but. It is a really good one to say basically they did this map and they showed that there's basically three or four wards in the lower city downtown and then the rest are, are from outlying areas that do not vote for anything in support of the downtown. They basically vote for everybody to go through the downtown as quick as they can but never stop because my goodness you don't want to stop in the downtown. Well that's not future thinking. That is not putting the city first. That is putting their ward first and their job first. And that holds development and that holds up our city. And right now, there are so many people that are moving to Hamilton from Toronto because it's, you don't, you know, everybody is realizing I don't need to be in a one bedroom condo when I'm working from home because I'm not commuting and I don't have to care about the commute. So I'm going to go buy a three bedroom house in Hamilton with a back garden I can sit in and work from home. And so we have seen a huge influx in people moving to Hamilton that are young, that are, want to make a change, that want to make a difference. We need to give them a Hamilton they can believe in and that they can make that difference in. Otherwise, we're going to miss this huge opportunity. Yeah, and I think that's my fear is that um, I remember when I was with the chamber, like we would run all these tours for LNN, ELN folks, like the... Um, the civic action young leaders group and like they would come to Hamilton and they would be given a tour and a lot of what they were interested in was transit. They were interested in, you know, Hamilton's progressive moves on the active transportation bike lane concept. But but then a lot of it was also attraction to the arts and culture and not for profit community and how uh, there were so many civic organizations uh, that were working together and the Hamilton, everyone seemed to be speaking off the same, you know, script uh, almost uh, in how everyone believed. And this was circa, you know, 2013 and 2018, like all those years where things were, you know, on the upswing. Um, and, and a lot of those people ended up moving. I still kept in touch with a bunch of them. A lot of people I went to school with at McMaster that left and then came back uh, for that, you know, back are for a more affordable apartment um you know now they're kind of wondering was that a false dawn was that a false promise and it is and you have businesses like i think it was like it wasn't dr Dis, but the other one and like all these other places that i love going to uh that are gone and like a lot of them are promising that they hope to be back after this is all over and they can open safely but who knows? And I think I think that's really the big thing is their impact can't be quantified in terms of just the taxes they pay because a lot of these businesses are worth, um, you know, substantially more in, in like the image to give to Hamilton, the, the impression and the vitality that they project to like investors. And these investors could be like big multinationals, but they could also be, you know, individual families that are just coming here for, used to come here for Supercall, not this year, but uh, just take a look around and, and, and they're attracted by something that can't be beat by, uh, you know, a lot of the other bedroom, so-called bedroom communities of Toronto in the GTHA. Mm -hmm. Tani, I feel like you want to jump in there. So for our ELN leaders, I think that the most real way to affect change is to get involved with the community. Um, join city council with our volunteer um, advisory groups. Um, 
uh, answer all of the survey questions because that's also very <laughs> important. I've put two of them in there now. Um, it's also if if you're saying that council needs to change, then I highly, 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 highly encourage all to seriously think about go, coming into municipal politics because that's really the way that we're going to affect change. So because as a city municipal worker, I work for you, the community. And so if you as the community tell me that these are the things that you're looking for, that's how we're going to make things happen. So for our ELN leaders, if this is about your opportunity to get involved, like I said, join the volunteer advisory groups, um, delegate to council. So like if something is like really pissing you off or you really want to talk about it, sign up to delegate, which means you do a five minute presentation in front of council um, or come out and be a counselor or apply to try and get to um, get a council seat. So I highly recommend that these are the these are the ways to really affect change here in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so just to maybe build off of that, because it is, I think, a question that's being upvoted in our chat, not to jump too far ahead, but just since you brought it up, um, maybe for Josefa or Rachel, like, do you have um, a similar maybe response to that question? Like, what can emerging leaders in Hamilton do right now to help with, um, with recovery? I would say volunteer. Tammy is completely right. Get involved in your community. Um, I think the challenge we have right now is it's volunteering is very different. We don't have the events. We don't have the community gatherings. So it's really tough. We actually are depaving a boulevard this week. Hilarious because we're doing it by hand. Oh, so fun. But it just reminds me how much I have missed having community members be able to come out and literally get their hands dirty. Um, pulling up concrete because that's where you meet amazing people who want to make a difference like you and it empowers you more because it is so hard to sit in an armchair and make a difference um, but it is much easier to find someone to walk alongside you and say hey I care about that too let's go and make a change so as Tammy said there are loads of things Hamilton is a very passionate city in that there are so many people fighting for things because sometimes you have to. So, you know, if it's getting trucks off your street, if it's environmental issues, Environment Hamilton, if it's, um, oh God, there's so many great organizations. Heck, you can, you're welcome to contact me. We're always looking for volunteers. <laughs> but seriously, there are so many groups. Just follow your interest and get involved. Reach out. Everybody would love to have an amazing volunteer and it may go somewhere. Yeah, I think it's about time, like, you know, our generation, so my generation, millennials, and uh, I think like Elan's probably a mix of Z, millennials, and then X. Um, you know, I think we really have to show up, and, and, and it's been shown in, in Canada and, and like many different countries that when young people actually put their foot in, and, and, and like this, this statement of like run for office has been said many times, and you don't have to do it, but there are people in, in the past municipal election that you know, there were young people who put their foot forward from from like the younger generations and, and they came close. But, you know, unfortunately, the, the problem with Hamilton is like the incumbency is very strong. Like if you're elected, I think the, the percentage going all the way back to the 80s or something, um, or I think post amalgamation is like in the 90s. It's very difficult for a counselor to lose their election, but there often are um, wards where they're, someone's retiring and then there's like a free for all. Um, and in a lot of different races could be tilted by people volunteering, but also um, I, I think if you have the means, um, opening up your checkbook because, you know, in Canada, like unlike the US with super PACs and things like that, we do have a very strict, you know, uh, donation limit, which isn't relatively that high. And oftentimes you'd be shocked at how much people like residents uh, who have a certain point of view where, where they want Hamilton to stay a certain way because it suits them and their opinion. Um, you know, them giving a few hundred dollars gets them the air of the counselor way more than, you know, the most influential Twitter personality. Because oftentimes you'll see like dialogue from counselors on Hamilton Twitter where they'll be like, yeah, it's just the Twitter mobs that have a certain opinion, but real people, real life people who 
are the people who show up to council and speak, who are the people on the committees, uh, which are open to anyone, who are the people who open up their checkbooks, who are the people behind opponent candidates, well, they don't feel that way. And I think the only way we can get rid of that impression is by creating this like bit of a wave where you're taking a multi-pronged approach because, you know, for years, I mean, I'm guilty of that as well. Like it, it's easy for me to just go on Twitter and, and, and say something kind of obtusely snarky about some decision that was made. And, and, you know, like a lot of my friends are also guilty of that, but a lot of what we've been talking about is maybe we're at an age and maybe where we got a bit lucky with our careers, but we can do a bit more than that where we can put our support behind people that are willing to put, you know, go to the ground and, and share the values of a lot of people in our generation and, 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 and really put the pressure on. Because if you look at the results, like there's like three new counselors in, in the downtown wards in Hamilton and, you know, by far everything I've seen so far, they've been kind of like isolated where they're voting, all three of them are voting for something I instantaneously seem to support. And then everyone else like the old guard seems to go the other way. Um, and, 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 and that happens, but there's some very critical decisions where sometimes despite this so-called division, some votes do come down to one or two like people on this side or the other. And that's been happening in Hamilton for a very long time. It might seem divisive in the beginning, but there's also a lot of counselors that speak a lot, but then when time comes, they often do make the right decision. But unfortunately, there's not enough of them for certain decisions that have happened in Hamilton's recent history that could have changed the city's direction uh, in a, a very radically different direction. A lot of it to do with LRT, but also some other, uh, you know, major decisions I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some great suggestions there. And I think from what I've seen, like organizations or groups that I've followed or been involved in, like they are trying to, you know, put their content in more of a virtual format, do virtual gatherings or, or conversations with this panel tonight. So I know it's like, it's fatiguing a lot, you know, to be online and, and then to be on a Zoom call also at night. But I mean, I guess to others point, like if you see a gap or something that could be done better, um, avoiding it doesn't help. <laughs> uh, it only really helps you. <laughs> but if you actually want to make something better, like join those groups and and maybe make some suggestions and, and take a lead. Um, so we have some good questions coming in and I wanna give time for that. So I know Alyssa has a closing question for this part of the discussion. So I'm just gonna pass it back to her. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, as a city, we are really at a crossroads. Um, we're at this intersection where our decisions today will have long lasting implications in years to come. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask the panelists what is the path forward for Hamilton, not just to recover, but to come out stronger? Um, let's start with Rachel there. Um, I think it goes into giving people, empowering people in their communities so they know they can have a voice and they can make a difference. I really feel that, you know, living, I live off Barton Street. I don't know if everybody knows about Barton Street, but Barton, um, was Hamilton's historic shopping district um, and then saw a huge decline in his struggles, big time. And unfortunately, this community um, was often in the news very negatively, you know, the, the spec many years ago, so about five, six years ago, was really negative on Barton Street, basically would say, who wants to live there? They would send reporters to see if they survive a walk along Barton Street. It was so bad. And people would drive along Barton Street and basically say to the kids, if you don't smarten up, you're gonna end up here. And like Barton was just, sorry, these things really frustrate me. And we would get these comments from people and we still do get these really frustrating comments from people who don't get Barton Street. They don't see the beauty that's behind the broken window or that's behind the, yeah, sure, maybe there's some garbage on the street, but there's beauty behind there. And the beauty is in the community and the people. And I think the minute you get allow people to be proud of their community and know they can make a difference, you empower them and this becomes their city and their city becomes amazing. And that is what we need to do. Thanks for those comments, um, Rachel. Um, I see you unmuted yourself there, Huzaifa. Why don't you go next? Yeah, like I, I think like throughout my, throughout this event, I've tried to offer solutions in addition to my somewhat doom and gloom outlooks at times, but I think 
the biggest thing for the next, you know, if you're looking at the next eight month window uh, that we can do is really care a lot about the people that are already here because the instinct for a lot of people, you know, in economic development in the city and even for everyday people is to look for the new shiny bright object, look for new people coming into the city, look for new businesses coming into the city, look for some big, you know, fancy initiatives like, you know, the Commonwealth Games, which we didn't touch today, but look for those big bright stars to like save us and be the silver bullet. But I think a lot of it is just, we have to care about the resiliency of like the next generation. So the people in high school who are going through some very interesting experiences, people who just started university and college, for whom that's a pivotal moment, um, our next generation, you know, how are their lives, uh, you know, going right now, people from wonderful communities, uh, you know, Hamilton having a disproportionately high number of precarious jobs compared to the GTHA, like, what are their lives like, you know, people who, who are impacted by COVID from a health perspective disproportionately, like, you know, Hamilton is an older community compared to the rest of GTHA, like what are their lives gonna look like? I think we really need to get our act together and think a lot more about that resiliency and building it and finding out where the problems are and coming out with immediate solutions for those gaps. Because, you know, it, it, the thing about this kind of climate is every day matters. You know, every day we wake up and we see you know, the number of new cases, uh, uh, COVID cases in, in Ontario, and then we create an impression of where our lives are headed because of that. Uh, just the same way, like, those people aren't just numbers. Those are, you know, real human beings with real lives. And same thing with businesses, with, with jobs, with, um, you know, like, healthcare workers, like, all the different aspects that make a city. We really need to, you know, dig inwards and, and take a look at that. Like, that, that that's my perspective. I think, uh, we did want to spend some time today thinking about you know the future, but we got to save our present because it's it's it, this community like is is resilient, it's it's diverse, but it also has a lot of vulnerabilities that you know are currently being exposed just because of something that no one expected. Thanks, Josefa. Um, on to you, Tammy. Your thoughts? Four words: buy local, support local. I think that those are the, the the best ways forward for us as a city. Um, that echoes exactly what Rachel and Huseifa have been saying, because at the end of the day, we need to support our small businesses that are currently here. Because again, the vast majority of our economy is on the backs of small business. So to buy local, support local. And then if I do my job well and the rest of my colleagues do our jobs well, we start to attract more businesses that will come here. And then when they come here, they become local businesses. So again, buy local, support local. So I think that that's the path forward. It's how we build a stronger and more resilient community is how we support our own. It looks like we've come full circle since we started the, the talks. And um, since you mentioned the topic on resiliency there, because it's not just personal resilience, it's definitely community resilience. So thank you for some of the comments um, that we're hearing today. I'm going to pass it over to Sarah to um, manage the Q&A section. Yeah, so I'll start us off by um, sharing the kind of the first question that's been um, come to the top of the list here. and. It does uh, touch a little bit on um, resilience and kind of, I think, circles. Um, actually, not even back to just small business. I think it covers most of our topics today. But anyway, so the question um, talks about, you know, we had um, a recession in 2008, as, as we all recall. Um, and the implications of those set us back um, in many areas. Um, so thinking of if you were starting a career at that time or, or postponing life milestones and things like that. And so um, the question is, do you think the city has learned any lessons in particular um, from the, that um, event? Um, and and how, how have they been leveraging any lessons learned? Um, uh, either through this pandemic or maybe just in general coming out of that recession. And so the um, question mentions Tammy in particular, I think you can all touch on it, but Tammy, do you want to start us off? So I wasn't, I haven't been in um, working for the municipal government until 2014. So it's a little before my time, but during that time, I can totally understand how our millennials would have been just coming out of school and uh, the, the turmoil that it caused. 
But to tell you the truth, 2008, 2010 was probably a turning point for the city of Hamilton. This was where we started to see the young professionals at that time really start to take leadership opportunities and to really start making investments in the city. And as Josefa mentioned earlier, we started to see a little bit of a turnaround when it came to that growth and that momentum that Hamilton started to receive in these pivotal times in the last 10 years. So I believe that we have learned a little bit from those 2008 times. We learned that we need to be a diversified economy. We learned that we can't be all of our eggs in one basket. We also learned about support systems and creating resources for new businesses and entrepreneurs. We also learned that sometimes throwing money at a problem is not the right solution. It is about arming our community with more information, with with knowledge, with connections and networking. And it is around making sure that sometimes we need to get outside of our own little bubble and start to interact and, and connect and make connections with, with um, different people. So I believe that we did learn a lot from that 2008 timeframe, but as, uh, as a Hamiltonian, I have personally seen the rise and the sort of, um, the, the growth and the momentum in the last 10 years of Hamilton and it's only just getting better. Sorry, we're, we're suffering a dip. It will soon get better. It will get better later is what I'm saying. So anyway. <laughs> you say for or Rachel, any thoughts there on previous pandemic and lessons learned or previous, sorry, <laughs> uh, recession and lessons learned? I think, um, and, and this is like um, part of like reason I guess I'm here so um, we didn't cover it but like the tech firm that I work for right now like we specialize in uh, digital unemployment and career transition support so we're actually uh, coming to Hamilton uh, working with all the employment service providers in a couple months so uh, Hamilton actually from that perspective is going to be one of the few communities in Canada where you, you can have like a digital employment services uh, kind of channel um, so we've learned a lot about what the challenges are but also like in the broader kind of economic system like for the longest time the idea has always been um, that there's people that go to universities and colleges uh, you know and that's the only vector to provide skills and, and 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 that will then make you employable in the labor market and then for the longest time like employers and and, and the broader you know like skills uh, ecosystem so that covers like skills trades and and other like labor market jobs um, that, that require like, you know, a lot shorter turnaround times, like they haven't really been focused on. And I think it's gonna be the same thing with, with COVID-19 where when you look at certain industries in Hamilton that will continue to, you know, kind of do well or do okay, um, real estate and construction is a good example where, you know, we're continuing to see high demand in residential. Um, you know, if you take a drive down King Street or Main Street, it more and more condos every time like, you know, I go back and visit family, um, but, you know, to fulfill those jobs, there are certain skill sets required that aren't covered by universities and colleges. So, so there's a big, you know, challenge really for cities like Hamilton is, can you bring those people in from outside? And if not, can you bring up people internally that have lost their job um, and, and, and can really be retrained uh, into these areas of opportunity that will be continue to be not so affected by COVID-19. Same thing with manufacturing, where if manufacturing required a lot of close contacts, so food processing is a great example, like some of the biggest um, outbursts in Canada have been at those facilities. Um, those, those are gonna always be a, a risk factor, but when you have a mix of automation and like, you know, more socially distanced manufacturing, there is gonna be demand for those because those, you know, companies will continue to operate. But then how do you move people from this company over to that company um, will be like a major challenge to ensure, you know, there's no lost generation because lost generation is really a concept where people had certain skills and then there's virtually no demand for those skills and they self-identify as someone who belongs to a certain profession and they just leave the labor market. So they're, they're out of the unemployment stats, they're out of like, you know, contention for future jobs because they just don't believe that there's anything out there for them. So it's like a really tricky thing that happens uh, and it happens because we don't really have really great mechanisms to like move people along um, and help them challenge their identity. So if you're 
and actuarial and suddenly actuarial jobs are gone, what else could you be? Um, and I think, I think that's, that's something where it's not just about governments and people in charge, it's also the onus is on us as ELN, as, as like young leaders and young professionals into, you know, can we bring other people along with us? Do, are we participating? Uh, and, you know, a shameless plug, but if, if, if folks in the audience are McMaster grads, like McMaster alumni has a great program where you can do like virtual, virtual mentoring with recent grads and, and older grads as well. And, and, and programs like that are, you know, fantastic, but those are community driven. And, and then there's a lot out there in Hamilton that you can learn about that, you know, has been shared in links, but, but there's more that can be done. Sorry. No worries. Um, I'm going to move us along to the next question, which is a tie. Um, so I'm going to pick a fun one and I'll direct it to you, um, Rachel. The fun question by anonymous attendee. Um, if you could wave a magic wand to help the city recover and prosper, what would you do? And what do you think is stopping us from doing that? Um, over to you, Rachel, to start us off. A fun one or a tough one? I <laughs> I don't have to pick just one, right? Like I can never pick just one thing. My goodness, what would I do? I would make things more equal, obviously, going back to my first statement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I would probably, well, I would make it fairer. So things like industrial truck routes that go through the whole of downtown, I would probably remove because that is not equal um, and hugely pollution issues, development issues, so many things. So I would get rid of industrial truck routes. I would um, provide supports to our small businesses to have the security that they need and should have access to. Um, I would try to create some form of incentive for developers who have property that is empty to have it inhabited. Um, so for example, sometimes when developers purchase property, they may purchase a residential house and border it up until they're ready for, to do their development. Well, could they not perhaps be partnered with Good Shepherd or Wesley so that that house that was usable prior to their purchase could house people, you know, for, or that don't have a place. So I would look at coming up with some of those places. I would also push the city to do the same with their properties, like the whole development um, at James and Bay that is just sitting boarded up right now, that is all homes that could very easily house all of the people that are in tents right now in, you know, unfortunate weather, no access to washrooms, no access to anything. This gives them that. So I would get more creative with how the city is, is handling certain things and maybe encourage them not to just look at it as a box or as black and white, but to see that there are gray areas and sometimes you have to creatively come up with solutions that may not be to the benefit of your ward, but they may be to the benefit of the whole city. Um, and I think it's really important to put the city first, not just your ward. Um put a pause on that because the follow-up question to it is, what do you think is stopping us from doing all of what you just said? <laughs> Did I not just say? Because I cannot come out and say that answer. <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're right too. You're okay to refuse, um, but I, I'm going to move on to the next panelist because it's important to couple those questions here and answer. Not just why, what, what you would do when you have a magic wand, but also what do you think is stopping us from doing that? Um, Kuzaifa or Tammy, who would like to start first to answer both questions? Yeah, I, I think very quickly I would say I would be able to enact all the plans that all the community in Hamilton came together to give feedback on that all the smart, intelligent, you know, civil servants in the city created and packaged together working with consultants, like all the different things we aspire in Hamilton about, there's already a plan for that. If you think mm -hmm. about the transportation infrastructure, there's a transportation master plan. Uh, it talks about bike lanes, has fully vetted routes for where trucks should go, where bikes should go, you know, what kind of transit you need at what point, everything's, I, I can link them all to you, but they're completely and utterly irrelevant if no one enacts them. So same thing with you know economic development. They have all these plans, the cultural master plan. Like I said, I gave hundreds of hours of my life, you know, and I don't regret a single second because I met some great people through it. 
sitting on all these citizen, you know, like volunteer events where they would invite you and show you these fancy slide decks and be like, what do you people think? And then we would give that feedback and then it would go be presented to council and then not go anywhere. So I think the number one thing that the reason people are attracted to Hamilton, why they're at this event, if they don't live in Hamilton is we are very effective salespeople of those clients. We're very amazing at creating videos that paint a picture of what the city will be, but we're very bad at following through it. So I'll just say, hit the green light, approve all of those, all these smart people came together, citizens came together and they said, we want this, so let's go give it to them. And I think the, to a diplomatic answer for, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to bail Rachel out, is it's not just council. I think it's um, also the people that they represent because the, the, the idea of Hamilton is for a lot of people, when we say, with, you know, I say with disdain sometimes that, oh, all these people think of it as a bedroom community. I think part of it is also that they haven't been sold on what the value and what the vision of like, for example, a revitalized downtown Hamilton is. I would be shocked at the number of people I would continue to meet all the way through like the full revitalization of Hamilton. We had the Juno Awards, we had the Pan Am Games who still had not visited Hamilton in like five or six years. And some of them would come in occasionally when there's a concert or something. Uh, but then they would park in some you know underground lot and then leave and never come back or, or they would just like run through like the middle of the city but I think part of it is also a communication issue where we're selling this vision, I think sometimes better to outsiders than we are to people that live in those suburban areas. Because a lot of them do occasionally, when you talk to them, you spend some time, they kind of wake up and they're like, oh, so if we were to have more office towers in downtown, my tax rates wouldn't go up as much. You know, it, it, there's different bulbs that click for different people for different reasons. Um, for some of them, it is when they finally go downtown and they see the great restaurants or cultural attractions, they're like, oh, like my kids can go do this and it's a safe, wholesome activity and they're not just, you know, sitting in the parking lot of the Cineplex in Ancaster, they now have something more interesting to go to, like theater, for, for example, they're interested in that. But it, for different people, it's different things. And I think we as like, if we call ourselves urbanists or whatever, passion Hamiltonians, don't often do a good time, good like job of bringing them all into the same table. Um, and, and neither does council. And I, like, and I think there's a lot of these gaps because it's always the same people that attend these events. And, and we got we got to branch out. All those thoughts there, Huzarfa, because I'm sure we'll get back to some of it. Um, I want to give Tammy a chance to wave her magic wand and to decide what would help the city recover. And if so, what do you think is stopping us from doing that? Go ahead, Tammy. Everything that Rachel and Huzefa have said, and then on top of that, better internet for the whole of City of Hamilton. <laughs> Big reason for internet is that internet, where is the next is the next great utility. And the fact is, it's a it's a very essential utility now. It's where we learn. It's how we communicate. It's also how we do business. But it's also an attractive asset to the city of Hamilton. So if I had to wave my magic wand, I would wave the said, but I also want fast internet. That's what I also want. Um, and I think the big reason for that, money. Stopping us. <laughs> but I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it costs a lot of money to do something like that. But I think that just as Huzefa had mentioned previously, it's about, we're really great at selling that vision, but it, people need to buy in. They need to understand why. And that also includes our telecom providers um the rogers the bells the kojikos to be able to say we also believe in that investment in canada in hamilton and this is why we're we're seeing what that vision is and how we we can do a lot with a, with very little so so i'm a, for me my big thing is definitely everything that they said and internet <laughs> the magic one is getting a lot of work here okay i'm gonna pass it on to sarah to ask the next question so this next one um, is kind of interesting. So um, the question is, do um, any of you know of any plans for um, municipal governments or chambers um, in the GTHA um, collaborating? Um, it asks kind of specifically to support small and medium businesses, but you could maybe speak to other collaborations that you are aware of or, or have seen, and, and if not, maybe speak to what that would mean for um, some of what we talked about today in, in kind of recovery, not just in the city, but, you know, as a region, how can we recover strong? 
So yeah, Tammy, I see your hand. So the chamber, the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, along with our Flamborough and our Stony Creek Chambers of Commerce, have all collaborated with um, the city of Hamilton on, and I, I, I had sent out a, a link earlier. Um, it's the Hamilton Chamber .ca slash COVID-19. It's a, a microsite that has all of these uh, different government grants available. But I think one thing that's a lot more exciting, especially to me, is the fact that um, our mayor has actually convened an economic recovery task force. So that economic recovery task force has also included not just our big institutions like the Max and the Mohawks and, and, uh, and our hospitals, but they've also included private sector uh, participants to actually weigh in from a private sector um, hat and perspective. So I think that I'm super excited about what that um, economic recovery task force is coming back with. There are essentially six working groups and from those working groups, it's everything from transportation and goods movement to the future of work. Like how is, how are we actively going to change the way we do work in Hamilton? So, so it's super exciting. It's literally in its final stages of writing, and we should be seeing some um, some of the final report, I think, in the next couple of weeks, maybe in a couple of months. But it's very soon. It's like imminently coming. So I'm super excited about that. Mm, Rachel. Um, so I know like there, there's AMCO, right, which is the Association of Municipalities in Ontario, something like that. Don't quote me. So that's where a lot of mayors and councillors get together and it's an organization that they have. So there are, um, you know, things in place that could facilitate that collaboration. Um, I am not involved with AMO just because obviously I don't wear that hat. Um, so I'm not sure where they're at. Um, I know as a BIA hat, we are really involved with OBIA, so that's the Ontario Business Improvement Area Association, because there's over 300 BIAs across Ontario. And so we've been doing a lot of advocating to the government with regards to getting supports for small businesses. So that's where the Digital Main Street grants came for. That's a 2,500 grant for small businesses to increase their digital presence, plus a whole bunch of other grants that we've got just because of COVID. Um, so we've been really advocating um, as a group there because I agree with you, Sarah. I think collaboration is really key, especially right now. We're all going through the same pandemic. So why can we not learn from everybody else's best practices? We don't need to all trip over the same stone. So let's find out where the stone is and make sure we avoid it, right? Uh -huh, for sure. If I don't know, you spend some time with both chambers. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything or maybe even from previous um, kind of time tackling um, a regional issue, if you could, if there was kind of collaboration there that would be beneficial here as well that you want to speak to. Anyways, I'll pass it over. <laughs> no, I get, I've tried to like uh, not comment on their affairs, but I, I think Civic action would be a great example because sometimes it's not just Chambers of Commerce, it's also like other organizations that need an anchor firm. So, you know, I think there's some civic action folks in the room, like you, you folks have had some great uh, projects over the years, like in terms of like regional transit, for example, like raising awareness about one, what you do in one community can also be done as a collective because we all have shared priorities. So uh, I think the chambers are playing a role, but it's also like, COVID has created an interesting dynamic where a lot of cities are also fighting for the tax base and it's kind of a more competitive space I've heard where everyone's now, you know, like the thing about collaboration is you kind of put that to the side because there's mutual benefit to working together, but some of that might be threatened by everyone trying to save their tax base and, and, and maintain companies. So, so it, it probably requires a more than one stakeholder to like play a role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. It'll be interesting to see how um, organizations like Civic Action, which typically um, try and bring um, a number of stakeholders together, kind of um, just the different kind of programs and initiatives and partnerships that come out of it. And, and to our point of kind of going forward stronger, like what 
uh, stronger partnerships might have come out of this between organizations or across regions, which would be um, really exciting um, as a benefit. Uh, so Alyssa, what's our next question? Mm -hmm. um, we have a tie for the next two questions, but I'm going to start with this one. It's, it seems like an interesting spin. Um, this is a question for all panelists. As a Torontonian, how would you market the city of Hamilton within urbanism aspect? So this is open to anybody who would like to respond. Go ahead, Tammy. We've always talked about, um, we try to make a comparison that um, people would understand. So we've always, in, in, our, in my department at Economic Development, we always say, Hamilton is to Toronto, like Brooklyn is to Manhattan. And the reason why is because when you think about Manhattan, it's shiny, it's financial, it's got lots of skyscrapers. That's how we would kind of consider, it's like the financial hub, it's the heart of the financial district. Um, that's how we kind of view Toronto being like, that's where our global city, it's how we, um, it's how we um, can, like a lot of business and commerce emanates out of there. But Brooklyn, Brooklyn's this cool, gritty, urban it's so close to manhattan it's it's where all the hip artists go that's what we want we want to be like that so that's how that's the way we talk about it in economic development hamilton is to toronto as brooklyn is to manhattan so that's that's the way i would try and market it uh, rachel is if i would add to it rachel go ahead argue that hamilton is to toronto what toronto is to ottawa <laughs> <laughs> just in that Ottawa is the capital, but everybody thinks that Toronto is the capital. So I'm being a little bit cheeky here, no disrespect to Torontonians, but I love Hamilton. Um, and I feel, so I, it's hard for me to compare it to Toronto because I've never, full disclosure, lived in Hamilton. Um, but Hamilton to me is the first place, I've only been here 10 years, but it's the first place where it feels like there's a community that cares and that it's a community that you can be a part of and that you can you can make it your community. Do you know what I mean? So I think there's so much potential in Hamilton. We're not finished. Like Hamilton is not a finished, closed book, we're done. There is so much still to do and you can be part of that story and we invite you to be part of that story. Here, here, I love that answer. And, and as you can tell, for those of you who are not Hamiltonians here, there's a lot of civic pride in this city and we're hearing that come true um, to this question, but also throughout the conversation that we have. Huzaifa, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a difficult question um, because one of the things that Hamilton will continue to have as an undeniable economic asset is it's simply, you know, and, and, and we don't talk about it overtly, but like it's simply cheaper right now than a lot of other communities. And, and for a lot of people, it will just be that if you're, if I live in a community that's more expensive than Hamilton, will I move here because I can get, you know, I'm starting a new family and I can get either cheaper rent or I can afford, afford to buy a place. I think where Hamilton can and still can continue to distinguish is no matter what the motivation was, whether it was that you were attracted by the uh, culture and art and like the natural assets that it has, like being on the uh, you know, uh, the Bruce Trail, the Bruce Peninsula, City of Waterfall, like, you know, everyone knows those talking points. Um, you know, what do you do with those new residents, new citizens, newcomers, and could be immigrants as well, um, you know, once they get there? Um, you know, can you really show them that while you might have the next hottest attraction, you know, it could be like Grimsby or something, or it could be going the other way to like Oshawa or Ajax Pickering for your, uh, you, you know, if that might be tempting to you, Hamilton offers a lot more than just a pure economic equation of this is a cheap place to live. Because when, when I talk to, you know, uh, friends of mine that work in real estate, like more often than not, that's the initial motivation. But then Hamilton has and continues, continues to offer like all these extra elements, a sense of community that's, you know, hard to beat um, and, 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 and has like a very unquantifiable value. And, and, you know, despite all my cynicism at times about some of the decisions that were made about, you know, small things like transit, um, you can't beat that. You can't beat the sense you get when you, you know, roll down the QEW and you turn in, um, you know, on the 403 and then you see like Hoots Paradise. Um, you know, that Wista, not a lot of cities can offer. Um, and, and I think it's really 
um, no matter what happens in the built up urban core, um, it's still a community that, that can give a lot of people a lot of different things, uh, but it has to maintain its social fabric. It has to maintain the things we experience after we land here, the, the how you can show up to any event in the city and, and then you'll be dragged into the circle and be taken to all these other civic events. You know, you apply for one opportunity and you might not get it, but the, you know, the organizers will be like, well, have you considered all these other things we're involved in? And, and you know, they'll open a door for you. And, and all those like small things that you don't really think about until, you know, you leave, which I, which I did. Um, and then you go back, you know, I, I go back to visit family and I'm like, I miss a lot of that because you know, I'm, I'm living in Toronto right now and it's like, I'm just a number. It's, it's like, I go to work, I come home and it's like, what We're else is there to do? Gold for the city of Hamilton. <laughs> well, there you have that. You have more than just a short yeah, marketing I spiel. I know. <laughs> You have more than just a short marketing spiel based, based on a question. It's awesome. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Sarah to ask, next, ask the next question because we have about, um, I want to say, seven minutes left before we close off. Yeah, it might be the last one. We'll see how we do. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going by the vote. So if there's a final one you want, like vote for it now. Up, up. <laughs> Just a plug. Okay. Um, so referring back to Huzefa, um, and a, po a point that you made earlier that we need to care for the people that are already here. So the question is, how can we ensure that Hamilton's pandemic recovery plan um, includes our community's needs and perspectives? Um, it also mentions that um, we do see sometimes that the advisory committees for the city are not always um, listen to and or taken seriously. Um, so you can comment or not comment on that. But the question of how do we ensure that the, you know, the recovery plan does consider our community's needs. And so maybe I'll start with Huzefa since it references your initial comment. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, because I think a lot of people in the community do have a frustration with just consistent ongoing surveys and consultations one after the other when it's not really clear and i think i mentioned in, in one of my earlier responses whether and how much of like what was heard was actually enacted so i think if if, if the next round of like the, i think the mayor has a committee and, and like uh, there'll be similar you know attempts like that by the chamber of commerce and like the community foundation and other organizations i think it's really really critical to show people if you contributed these concepts here's what we're going to do and here's what the timeline is because oftentimes like what a lot of people have frustration where there's like these, these this feedback is heard and then there's a lot of people that lo love participating in these things but then you know what comes out of it as an outcome support is like well what we heard and then it's like a weak set of commitments and i think given what i said earlier about like the urgency of the human impact the pandemic has had we have to do better we have to put firm you know two month three month or not even three month, like a one month timeline on what comes out of these different things. So, you know, I, I can sit here and I can make up like what some of those resiliency things are. Like, you know, people will talk at a very high level about universal basic income, uh, but you can go all the way down to like uh, grants and, and, you know, digital main street, like in, initiatives for like arts and culture businesses on Barton street that don't know what to do or where to start. You can go micro and macro, but, and, and all of this, these ideas will be shared by people, but it's really about, you know, will the city, but, and the other organizations running these initiatives, will they, will they put their money where their mouth is? And will they commit actual money to all of these different promises? Or will it just be pawned off to another set of studies and another set of consultations uh, and, you know, subcommittees and, and, you know, community organizations and all of that. So I, th I think that's really where some of my frustration comes from is, in, in normal times, that was fine. Like progress is slow, I understand that. But now, like, I think in a lot of cities, there are initiatives happening that we can learn from where things are moving a lot more rapidly because of like, you know, the, the dire need for uh, some of that resiliency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another good point about partnerships and collaboration and, you know, not working in um, a silo where, you know, you could learn from someone else for sure. Um, so I saw Rachel, your hand up. 
Yeah, so I totally agree. Collaboration is key because that will help keep you motivated and not lose heart when you constantly get doors slammed in your face. But I would say that too, keeping with it, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing out of frustration with regards to the advisory committee comment and how sometimes members are being silenced and how disheartening and, you know, that is because it makes you not want to say anything, right? So I totally get it, but I would encourage everyone to please still say stuff because you, you're not just talking to for yourself, right? At the end of the day, you're representing people who don't always have the ability to have that voice. So say, stay strong and partner with somebody else or an organization that can come alongside you. So you're not doing it by yourself, but don't give up hope. I mean, we all know, I'm sure about what happened with Sobe when Uber canceled the contract and then wanted to pull out and then counselors just decided, oh yeah, let's just cancel it. And then the community stood up and said, hell no, we need that. We believe in it and we're getting it and we've got it. So, you know, sometimes community can make a difference. It can be a huge uphill battle, no doubt. And it can sometimes take years. This deep pave we're doing on the boulevard just to get a tree on Barton Street because we don't have hardly any has taken two years of planning and fighting, but we're getting it. So, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Sure, it might be a long tunnel, but, you know, make sure you've got good people that are strong beside you that can keep you focused and, and stay focused. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah, that's so important. Like, it can be frustrating, but um, not uh, standing up and saying something um, doesn't get us any farther than standing up and... Um, and being ignored or, or not being taken seriously. And so that's frustrating, but um, I know like Sobe, that was a huge one. Um, for me, I ride Sobe's all the time. So I was very grateful that the community kind of rallied around that. And Ellis and I were part of a group that um, kind of wrote a letter um, when the mayor's task force for economic recovery was getting started, just kind of reminding them about some of the um, strategic plans that the city had developed from consultation and, and our hope that those would be included and, and um, it was presented at council and read. So um, those are small efforts, maybe, I don't know, we'll see when the plan comes out, but um, it's, it is it kind of empowering to be part of them. And, and to your point about surround yourself, like surround yourself with other people who share and will support those efforts, right? Because then you, it, you don't feel so alone almost like you're the only one um because we know there are others right and sorry i kind of jumped <laughs> into the answer of that question but i don't know tammy do you uh, want to add anything on this before we um, wrap up so the official way of talking to us is well one you can send us an email because we have lots of emails and they're all really easy it's like first name la first name dot last name at hamilton.ca but you have counselors. So as a resident of the city of Hamilton, you have a counselor that oversees your ward. So if you're really upset about something, talk to the counselor because the counselor is there to work for you, the community. I am hired by the city to work for you, the community. So when you guys are upset, you have, there are lots of the, the issue and the point is really to drive home to our counselors, to our elected officials that this is this is not right and this is what we need, this is what we want to see. And as a voting person, you have that right to talk to your voted in elected officials. So I do highly recommend that you start to really exercise that and really connect with your local elected representative but then there is also City of Hamilton staff that are also, again, hired by the city in order to service you, the community members. So that's my official City of Hamilton talk. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tammy, Huzefa, and Rachel. Um, before we officially wrap up, I'm just going to pass over to, I think, either Miriam or Nicole, uh, just to, um, yeah, wrap Hi.
hopefully. Yep, we can hear you, Miriam. Okay, perfect. Um, I just wanna, so I sit on the executive team the current year and I just wanna say a big thank you to Alyssa and Sarah. Um, for, it's so cool that you obviously are both in Hamilton and speaking on this event. So really appreciate you guys moderating. And, and of course, a big thank you to our panelists, Rach, mad props for you guys joining us. Um, so in the evening, we Um, we're having trouble hearing you, Miriam. So um, I yeah, wonder if it. Nicole could pick it. And of course, to all of the attendees, thank you so much, everyone. I think I'll jump in. Um, hopefully my internet connection um, is a little bit stronger. I believe that there is a poll that is going to pop up. Um, I'm Nicole, by the way, from the executive team at ELN. Um, I believe that there's a poll um, that we're hoping everyone can fill out. It will help us plan for future events on ELN. Um, so if you could give that a look. Um, while you're doing that, I want to invite everyone on the call to get involved with ELN. So you can follow ELN on Twitter um, and Facebook. Uh, we also invite you, if you're not already on our monthly newsletter, please go and subscribe. You can get that on the Civic Action Leadership Foundation website. And we also um, soon will be launching a book club. Um, we did one back in the spring and we'll be doing another series shortly. So we will be announcing that soon. Uh, so do stay tuned. We wanna thank everyone again for joining us tonight and all this amazing speakers. Um, it's been a really great conversation. Uh, we will let you um, fill out the poll if you haven't already and we will sign off. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night.